Yeah. Okay. Once you get the green light, you're live. Yeah, hold on. Good morning, everybody. Um, kind of a dreary day. We're going to hope that it doesn't rain on the campers either so that they are enjoying the But we want to welcome everybody here and those of you that are online and joining us. Um, I'm Alexis Bell, for anybody who doesn't know. So it's great to have here. It's great to have Pastor Jeff here to preach for us. So let's bow our heads in the and an opening prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today with open hearts and open minds that we may hear your word and take it to heart. Please be with us as the week progresses. Help us to do the right things and be the right people in the right places. We ask all this in your son's name, amen. Okay. 
Um, my name's Robin Smith, and I'm doing the call to worship. It's uh, going to be a responsive call to worship. It's Psalm 138. I'll read the white, and you can respond with the yellow. And it's on page 505 in the hymnal. Can, yes, please stand up. Thank you, Don, Marilyn. <laughs> OK, now if I can read it. Um, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your name. When I called you, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord's is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he was kindly on the lowly. Though long he sees us from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Amen. And now we'll uh, sing uh, worship in song. Yep. And okay, I got it. Uh, the these are all in the hymn book. I'm sorry, I don't play the guitar, and you really wouldn't want me to. So our first hymn is number nine, Glorify Thy Name. Thank mm -hmm. you. Number 713, Seek Ye First.
number 692, God will take care of you. Okay, time for the announcements. We're going to start with birthdays and anniversaries. This week it's birthdays. Um, tomorrow's Mackenzie Mastins. The 6th of September is Valerie Bells and James Trombley's. The 7th of September is Diana Sweeney's. The 9th of September is Colin Congress. 
and the 10th of September is Brody Edgerly. We do have one here, Colin, so I think we need to sing. Happy birthday to you and happy birthday to you. Thank you, Jesus, here every day of the year. A happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, and the best year you've ever had. So if you see any of the others, make sure and wish them a happy birthday. Um, some of the announcements are in your bulletin. They're looking for somebody to clean the church. Um, if you're interested to get a hold of, you know, reach out to the church or to Tyler. Service time change. Next week, we go back to the 1030 worship time. And I believe Sunday school also starts next week. So next week, Sunday's going to be busy. It's also Faith and Work Sunday. And the special Sunday next time is for um, health care workers. Doctors, nurses, EMTs, um, paramedics, all of those, PT, um, all of those people. The special speaker is going to be Dr. Joe Nasca. There are green flyers um, up back on the organ so that you won't know of somebody that's in the healthcare field and would like to invite them, by all means, do so. Um, there's going to be special goodies after. The 55 plus lunch, plus lunch gets back to in going this month on the 23rd, 11 o'clock in the Jimmy Center. Uh, everybody make sure and say there are refreshments today out in the vestry. Um, one other, I got a phone call from Jeff Sweeney that he is has built a corn maze. Um, it's opening today from 12 until sundown. Uh, it's gonna benefit the Jimmy Center like it has in the past. And he said, there's going to be a special guest today, Cuddles the Cow, from 3 to 6. So if you know anyone who loves cows or you know, little kids that like cows, it might be nice to come see Cuddles. I did hear via the grapevine that this one's quite the corn maze because Jeff got himself lost in it. <laughs> so <laughs> you know it's going to be a good one, and if even the creator gets but I, it's really neat. I have been before um, when he's done it, and it's just awesome. And, you know, families and kids love to go. It's something you do as a family. And um, he's doing it to benefit the kids in the community. So that's awesome. Robin, you had something you wanted to share? All right, any other announcements? Carolyn. I have one thing. I, I missed a couple of Sundays, so I don't know if this has been mentioned, but yes, we have canceled the turkey supper for this year. The reason for that is that when we had to make the decision, it looked like this new version of Omicron was circulating in the county, and it has circulated. I guess it turns out people aren't being as sick as we feared, but we had to cancel it. So it is canceled for this year. Okay, so in case those of you on live stream didn't hear, um, Carolyn, the turkey supper for this year is canceled. Again, things were iffy with that newest strain of the Omicron virus. Any others? If not, um, if we have kids young enough, when it I was going to say, I only saw a couple, and <laughs> it looked like they were with Grandma. Oh. Okay. Then next up is Heather with prayer time.
Good morning. Um, let's bow our heads and be together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to worship together this morning, whether in person or in spirit online. We ask that you open our hearts to hear your word. As we enter the time of year that includes many changes, we ask that you continue to walk with us and remind us in your many ways that we can trust in you. There are numerous changes ahead of us that can make us uneasy. Help us to continue to look to you to guide us on our way. We also lift up those who are struggling with various things, including sickness, sadness, or fear. You know those people who are on our hearts, and we ask you to be close to them in their struggles and help them to know that you are close by and are looking to have a relationship with them. We also celebrate with those who are celebrating births, anniversaries, birthdays, and other successes in work or in school. You too celebrate with us and take joy in any opportunity we have to further your kingdom. We ask you to be with us in this service as we celebrate the joys that you have and that we have in you. We pray that we continue to walk with you in school and in work and in the community. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm not sure if we have a specific scripture reader or if now's the time I um, introduce Pastor Jeff to come up um, and preach for us. Thank you, Heather. Good morning, church. Some of you know me, some of you are still probably trying to forget. I'm Jeff Cornwell. I've had the privilege of serving as pastor. I did for many years in Milton at the United Church, 32 years. And Tyler, I've known for a number of years now. We are in a prayer ministry together for pastors. And I just think he's an exemplary young man and have uh, relish the opportunity to get to know him. So I guess he and a number of others are away today. We are the people who have stayed behind and stayed home. They're the people, what can we say of them, that they are intense? Okay, I got you to groan, so I, that's what I wanted to accomplish. Very good, let's get it all out now. Well, as I look at scripture, um, Tyler late in the week said, you know, I know you probably have thoughts about what you want to preach, but would you mind adjusting and thinking about looking um, deeper into Exodus so that we can continue to build momentum? And um, I, I said, well, Tyler, I'll give you an answer tomorrow morning. And so after praying about it, I said, yes, I'll do it, not realizing that I would have to do a fair amount of work, more than I thought. It was kind of interesting because Tyler said, do you remember once, maybe four years ago, I had a Sunday off in August and I came to your church and I think you actually preached on this passage. So I said, well, that's helpful. Um, I went back and looked in my Bible and there were a few notes still written in the margins, but that's not enough because this is a new day and a new time. If it's four years later, the Lord has done a new work since then in me, not least of all. So I've been thinking about this passage and you know, we're in Exodus 15. And I know you were, last week I suspect, you were looking at the song of Moses and Miriam 
And this was, of course, a celebration as we uh, kind of set the table for what I want to talk about today. And it's the song of Moses celebrating the great victory of God when he led the children of Israel through the waters of the Red Sea. And it was a great victory, and Moses wrote a song. And when I was just 20 years of age, when I met the Lord and started uh, becoming involved in a church, somebody wrote words to this particular passage out of Exodus 15, and I still remember the words all these years later, 45 plus years, I will sing unto the Lord. No, I won't sing it to you, but the words are still powerful. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord my God, my strength, my song, and I will rejoice. And so it was a story about loving on God and celebrating a great victory. So whether it was Moses or Miriam who celebrated the song and sang it a little bit later, it's a powerful celebration to the victory of God that was won at the edge of the Red Sea. And uh, Miriam finished off that song echoing the refrain, I will sing unto the Lord for he is highly exalted, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. And so you can imagine Miriam uh, celebrating along with the other women of Israel the great victory of God. Why is that important? Well, because my mother's name was Miriam. And so this is a song that's always been powerful for me because uh, every time I read it and think about it, I think of my mother singing songs to me when my sister and I were little and growing up. So I still think about those songs of faith. Well, I wanna take you then to Exodus 15, beginning at verse 22. As we listen for the word of God. Then Moses led Israel on from the Red Sea, and they went out to the wilderness of Shur. They journeyed for three days in the wilderness without finding water. They came to Marah, but they could not drink the water at Marah because it was bitter. That's why it was named Marah, or bitter. And the people, well, they reacted, of course, the people grumbled to Moses, what are we going to drink? And so Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he threw it into the water, the water became drinkable, and their thirst was quenched. And so he made a statue and, and, and ordinance for, themself, uh, for them at Marah, and he tested them there. Don't think that it wasn't a test. He tested them there and he said, if you will carefully obey Yahweh your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you will pay attention to his commands and keep all his statutes, I will not inflict any illnesses on you that I inflicted on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh who heals you. And then they came to Elam, where, they were, where there were springs of water and 70 date palms, and they camped there by the waters. Here ends our reading from scripture. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We treasure it in our hearts and minds. We give you permission, Lord, to let your spirit range over the full text of scripture. We pray that you would bring it alive in heart and mind. Show us, Lord, what you would have us to take away today, how we might integrate it, integrate it into the way that we live, into the very fabric of our lives. We pray that we would see you at, week this, uh, at work this week in all the things that we do, the things that we think. We pray that you would set our feet on your path and lead us in the way that you would have us to go. Make your word come alive through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, you'll be glad to know perhaps that I wrote out some notes today just to make sure that I stay on target and so if some of you like alternative titles, you know, uh, or later in the week um, when I was thinking, Tyler said, well, would you like a title? So rather quickly I said, thirst. Well, that accomplishes something. But maybe if you'd like an alternative title, I could propose this one, How Dry I Am. On a hot day, a humid day, some of us who play sports or engage in other activities, if you've been out cutting the grass, you know just how warm it can get and how thirsty we can become. And uh, as you look around the world today, 
There's water, water everywhere. You think about what the stories that we're hearing of Pakistan, what the pictures that you're seeing in the news, perhaps a third of the nation underwater, unimaginable. What would it be like if a third of our country were submerged by water? I can't even imagine what that would be like. And then you think about uh, the lack of water in other places. And you think about Jacksonville, Mississippi. Oh, they have water enough, they just can't drink it because it's not safe. Water, water everywhere, and yet we have nothing to drink. We are a thirsty people, you and I, and we're looking for something and someone who will slake our thirst. You know, when you look at this scripture in Exodus 15, it's really a story of two chapters or two different days with a three-day span in between. The children of Israel have just come through the Red Sea and been mightily delivered by God and we discover that they're singing and celebrating, rejoicing in this extraordinary triumph. First the party, but you know what happens after the party, don't you? Then comes the aftermath, or for some, the hangover and the headache. And then reality sets in, and it doesn't really take very long. Think of it this way, after the wedding ceremony, after the reception is over and the guests are gone, after you graduate and you get your dream job and you move to another city of your desire, and after the person that you admire says yes and gives you your first kiss and says they will be your steady partner, and after you drive the new vehicle off the lot at the dealer and you're all excited and there's that new car smell, but then we know what happens a few days or a few weeks later, then reality sets in, doesn't it? The hard work begins. The payments come due, maintenance continues. You have to keep that car clean. How many of you discovered after you got married, lo and behold, that marriages require work? They don't happen automatically. Love takes work. Maybe that's why my father used to say, cook and last, love and don't. But love and can if you work at it. Years ago, I remember seeing a cartoon in The New Yorker and a woman, uh, one of the guests at, at a wedding, she leaned over to the couple as they were walking down the aisle to say their vows and she said, tell me, are you planning a long marriage after the ceremony? <laughs> we all know that relationships take work. Have a great victory and soon you will be challenged. After great victories, there are sometimes great troughs and great valleys. After things go exceedingly well, almost all of us know not to rejoice too much because we're always afraid when the, what do we say, when the other shoe will fall? I think that's the cliche that we often use. But we understand that things are likely to change because life is like that. It has vicis vicissitudes, there are ups and downs. Things happen that we can't predict and certainly can't control. Now when you look at the text this morning, if you remember back to the former part of Exodus 15, after the great victory, what we discover is that God had to harden the hearts of the Egyptians. Get this. He had to harden the hearts of the Egyptians to chase the children of Israel into the sea. Can you imagine? There was dry land. The Israelites were escaping right through the middle of the Red Sea. I'm sure the charioteers, they were brave warriors, but I'm sure they had never seen anything like this. No one had and so they had to be forced. They had to be motivated, prompted to chase after the Israelites. I'm sure they wanted to hold back, like not going in there. This does not look good. But it was God, we are told, who hardened their hearts. Look back at Exodus 14. God hardened their hearts. But the one thing that God didn't need to do was to harden the hearts of the children of Israel. Of Israel. They did that on their own. And the reality is that their hearts were hardened against God. Their hearts were not yet soft or tender or entirely open and trusting. But what would you expect? Things were difficult for them. And yet, on the other hand, they had just won at the presence of God a great victory. But just three days later, marching into the wilderness, the people are wondering where they're going to get something to drink. God, they had seen the powerful deliverance of God trapped between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea, an expanse of waters open before them, and God had parted the waters and led them through, get this, on dry ground. How did he do it? We're not told, but he did deliver them to the other side and safely brought them through on dry ground. 
But on this particular day, God has the opposite problem. And the problem is that they don't entirely trust God. They don't entirely trust his goodness. And so when they run out of water three days deep into the wilderness, what are they going to give their flocks and herds? Well, where will they find water for their children that's good to drink? And so they grumbled at Moses. What are we going to drink out here in the wilderness? Good question, Moses. You're the elected leader. You're the one who wanted to lead this rabble of people. Where are you going to get water to, 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 uh, to assuage the thirst of all these people? You ever listen to a child on Christmas Day? They're all eager and excited to unwrap their presents in the morning. But what happens by evening on Christmas Day? You ever notice that there's a little bit of a slump and a little bit of a letdown for most of us? The air kind of goes out of the room. And have you ever heard a child say something like, that's it? Somehow, I thought there would be more. And you want to say, you ungrateful child. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? I know that doesn't happen at your home, but we've all thought things like this, and sometimes we even say them. We probably shouldn't, but we speak them out loud. Well, Mom, this isn't exactly what I wanted. <laughs> and so you can just imagine the heart of a parent going, oh my goodness, what do I need to do to prove my love and to prove myself to you? You see, it's one thing for God to woo and to pursue the children of Israel, but it's another to capture their hearts. And the reality is that they're now stuck with each other. Israel is stuck with God and God with Israel. He promised to lead them to the land of promise, the promised land. He said he would take them there. And the children of Israel have agreed to trust God to get them there, but it's not an easy relationship. Um, one speaks uh, what's on his mind and the other does too. So it's a back and forth relationship. And what we understand here is that reality sets in and we move from the miraculous to the mundane, from the sublime to the ordinary. We, uh, we, I suppose the word we might use for that is pedestrian. This is just the normal give and take of life. Reality sets in day after day. Cook and last, even if love don't. So after the party, then comes the hard work the hard work of relationship. Just ask the Lord God what it's like for him. Now think about it for a moment. It must have been pretty easy for this God, the creator of everything that we see and survey, you and I. It must have been pretty easy really for God to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. You know what God's problem was? Israel, getting Egypt out of the people. They were the problem for God, not Egypt. So it's a problem of the heart, and it's going to take a lot of testing, and that's what God does. He brings pressure. He tests the people in order to soften their resistance, to soften their hearts, and to try to prove his love, to convince them that he is for them, that he cares for them. Pharaoh, no problem. Children of Israel, hmm, what am I going to do with them? Well, years ago, there was an Old Testament professor by the name of Klaus Westermann, and he talked about the God of Israel. And he said God proved himself over and over. He proved himself to Israel by delivering them from the Egyptian army at the Red Sea. He proved that he was a great warrior. He proved that he could deliver them. What they didn't know, however, if he could also provide for them. God had yet to display that side of his nature and character. God is a great warrior, but can he also provide for us? Will he be a provider? Will he also prove to be a God of blessing? And so the people don't understand. So three days in the wilderness, they're thirsty, and they simply ask a real question. Where are we going to get water to drink? Moses, what are we going to drink out here? How dry we are. Now the Red Sea provided a great victory over the Egyptians, but I can just hear some people saying, that was so yesterday, God. What have you done for me today? What have you done for us lately? Now you and I might not be so abrupt to say those things or so obvious, but tell me that you haven't felt some of those things, that on occasion you haven't thought some of those things to yourself. Lord, where are we going to get water? What are we going to do? We must have wondered, did you bring us out here to die? What are you doing, God? Are you actually trustworthy? 
And so all we can say is perhaps what Elie Wiesel said. Uh, Elie Wiesel was a, a Nobel Prize winning novelist, but he also wrote about religious themes and he wrote theology. You might not have read much of that or heard much, but he asked an interesting question about Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness. He said, you know, when God takes them out of Egypt, you know, the people have a question. After 400 years, God, where were you? Why did you wait so long? Why did it take so long to bring us out of Egypt? After 400 years, the children of Israel don't exactly trust God. They're not sure he's trustworthy. Why did it take so long? And so if they behave like slaves, why, God, are you so surprised? After 400 years, of course they're going to behave like slaves. After 400 years, most of the freedom has been snuffed out of them. They've been fed, they've been watered, taken care of. Yes, it was a terrible bargain. Yes, they had to work for Pharaoh and the pressure was great, or shall we say oppression, but they had three square meals a day and enough to drink. It was an awful bargain, but they endured it. And so for the children of Israel, they're looking for something. They don't know what God is going to do for them. God is a God of promises. Yes, he has delivered them. Yes, caught between a rock and a hard place, the Egyptian army behind and the sea between. He did the impossible, the implausible, and the preposterous. He parted the waters and brought them through. And there they are on the other side. And now three days deep into the wilderness, they're getting thirsty and they're looking for something to drink. And so, here comes the test. Well, what comes out of you when the pressure's on? You ever pick up a sponge and when you wring it out, you, if you're washing your truck, you're washing your car, it's full of dirty, soapy water and you wring it out. So my question is, what comes out of you when the pressure's on? If God were to take and put the squeeze on your life, what's going to come out? Praise and thanksgiving, gratitude and rejoicing, or doubts and fears, uncertainty, complaining. What's going to come out? And that's what God needs to know and understand. And he also needs to expose whatever's in the people to the light of day so he can bring it forth for healing. So what does God do? He tests them. And don't think that God doesn't test. How many of you know that God tests us? He probes. He wants to understand not to fail us, but like every good teacher, Alexis, why do teachers give tests? Is it to make the students fail? To make sure that we teach them what they need, to find out what we need to teach them that they don't already know. So I think God is probing not to fail them, not to abandon them, but God needs to know where they are and what's really on the inside so he can begin to address their concerns. But it is interesting how it moves from this great victory chant to a song of dirge or a funeral dirge. How dry we are. Moses, Moses, where are we going to get water? And so finally after three days, there they are. Yay, they finally find springs of water but here comes the second test of God, a new application. What happened to the water? They can't drink it. It's there, it's there to be had, but it's full of PCBs. They can't drink it. It's not safe. It's like living in Jacksonville, Mississippi. We have water, we just can't drink it. It's not safe for the children to drink. And so their reaction is one of bitterness. Mara was the place, the place name that they gave it because it was a bittersweet experience for the people. Look, water's ahead. Unfortunately, we can't drink it. And so it resulted in a bitter reaction. Did you ever suck on a lemon? It's thirst quenching, kind of, but you have to get past the bitterness in order to allow it to quench your thirst. And so we're told that the people became embittered. And I love the word that they use there. The word, they grumbled, they griped, they groaned. My favorite expression that captures that is the word murmur. They murmured. You ever heard murmuring? Sometimes used to apply to murmuring waters. Not very loud, but chatter, chatter, chatter. A little bit of complaining, a little bit of grumbling, a little bit of griping. Not too loud. If you listen carefully to what the children are saying in the back seat, that's what I call murmuring from time to time. And that's what they're doing to Moses. Moses, Moses. Where are we going to get enough to drink? 
where are we going to find water? Just three days in, the people are already doubting the possibilities of God. And so let's, not, let's do realize that these were people who had already put up with a lot. These were not weak people. How do you survive 400 years in, in servitude in Egypt? How do you do that? You can only do that if you have great strength. You can only do that if you have perseverance and are willing to endure. And then they get this wonderful taste of freedom. They're escaping Egypt. They're coming away with spoils. They come to the Red Sea and like, this isn't so good. And then they look behind them and the Egyptian army is chasing chariots. In other words, these are the most up-to-date weapons uh, that the Egyptians had. And so here they are. They must have been traumatized. Why did you, Moses, why did God bring us out here only to slay us? We could have died back in Egypt and at least had full tummies there. And so here they are. They're slaves. They're vulnerable. They're enduring trauma. They have children. They have lines, uh, livestock. What are we going to do? How will we get to the other side? And who's going to take care of us, Moses? So their fears are real. Let's not miss that. And yet they are strong. And the people behind them, well, charioteers with the latest technology and weaponry. And so what did God do? God staged a mighty miracle. He delivered them in the most amazing and astonishing of, way, astonishing of ways so that this miracle has become absolutely known with the greatest acts of God in time and history. The God who delivers us at the Red Sea. Even if you've never read the Bible, you may well have heard of Moses delivering the children of Israel at the Red Sea. It's a well-known sign and wonder. People use that to talk about the acts of God. So did it really need to come to that? Did God really need to do something that dramatic? And my answer would be yes. In order to prove himself and his love to the people that he could take care of them, yes. It had to be just that dramatic for them. And so a few days later, God needs to show himself in a different manner. He needs to show that he can do day after day that he can do what's needed to take care of them, to be the kind of provider that his people need. Yes, there was water, but it was undrinkable and it was bitter. What the people need to learn is that their God is able, that he really is able to take care of them and to keep them alive. And so when they reacted, we understand what happened. They couldn't drink the water. What happened to them? They became embittered. Plenty of, no, plenty of water, but none of it we can drink. Figures, doesn't it? Figures that we would get a God like that. But there's more. They haven't seen yet all that God is prepared to do for them. And so God takes them on a journey. Unfortunately, it was a journey that should have taken, could have taken only a few weeks. How many of you know how long they were lost in the wilderness? 40 years. Do you know that the journey could have been completed in just a matter of weeks? It really wasn't a great distance, but that several week journey turned into 40 years. Why? The only reason I can discern in most scholars, because the people murmured. They complained about what God was doing. So God, well God proved to be the kind of provider that they needed. He took care of them, but every single one, that's not true, there were two people that made it into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb, only two who never complained. But the rest of the generation, that entire generation perished in the wilderness. They never reached the promised land. Moses got close, he got to see it, but God held him back and didn't allow him to go on to the next phase of the journey. Only two of them actually got to enter the land of promise. So. What do you think about murmuring? What do you think about complaining? All I know is this. If you want to stop a move of God in your life or a great move of God in the church, if you want to stop it, here's the how you do it. Start murmuring. Start complaining. Start grumbling. Start blaming God. Start finding fault with God. And I can tell you that things are off with God. The surest way to end a move of God to cause him to step back or to retreat in your life 
is to start complaining about the way that he's handling things in your life, the way that he's handling your affairs. If you don't like it, start complaining. But all, all I can tell you is he'll take care of you, but you will never advance. There's more. God has a promise for us, a land of greatness. God has great things in mind for his people, but he has to get Egypt out of the people. He has to find out what's in this generation, and he has to expunge that in order to prepare them to be the kind of people that he's looking for, a people who will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And so the people, they grumbled. God forgive us when we do likewise, you and I. I remember hearing years ago that grumbling, murmuring, I heard this and it struck me, grumbling is the praise language of hell. I've never forgotten that. So what do you think the prayer language of heaven is? Rejoicing, gratitude, giving thanks. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, even before you ask, yes, Lord, have it your way. Let your will be done. That's a whole different sound to it. It has a whole different tone. And so we find that the people were complaining about their, cir their circumstances. And to the extent that they complain, they were not free. You ever notice that? When you start complaining about your circumstances, there's no freedom in that. Oh, it's so hot today. Oh, that was so hard. Oh, it's so cold out today. Guilty. Oh, those pews are uncomfortable. Oh, he spoke so long. Oh, they expect me to tithe at that church 10%? Oh, these things are so hard. Start murmuring. And to the extent that we do that, what's happening is that God would like for us to hear our own words because we speak death and we speak life. By our own lips, God imposes upon us the consequences of our own words. If you speak life over yourself, life will come to you. If you speak death into your life, then don't be surprised if death arrives at your doorstep or mine. If we speak according to the truth, then God can do extraordinary things. If we speak to our faith, God can build our faith and move in mighty ways. To the extent that we grumble and murmur, though, about our circumstances, all I can say is we are not free. So on this occasion, what God wants to do three days into the wilderness is to find out where the people are. Take their measure. Let's test and see where they are after 400 years held in bondage to slavery in Egypt. Let's find out where they are. And then let's see what needs to be done in order to bring them to a better place. Not a bitter place, but a better place. For years now, one of my prayers has been, Lord, teach me how to live free, how to live loved. Teach me how to live in your love, how to live into the fullness of what you have prepared and purposed, appointed and anointed for those whom you cherish. I believe that God wants great things for us, for his people, and that he expects great things for us, and that he's willing to do great things for us, but he's not looking for murmuring. He's looking to expose the darkness in us and the doubts, but only to bring us to a better place and a deeper level of trust. So, let's look at the story one more time here. They arrived on that day at the waters of Mara, and they discovered that they were bitter, that they were absolutely undrinkable. And as we look at that, then the people cried out, Moses, what are we going to drink? Where are we gonna get water? Well, Moses had the good sense to do something that the people didn't. They turned to Moses, but Moses, did you notice as we read it, Moses cried out to God. You could call it prayer, but Moses knew where to turn when he had a problem. Lord, what are we going to do? You've heard the cries of the people. You know what's on their lips. You know what the needs are. And so Moses prays to the Lord, and God gave him a strategy. What did he tell him to do? He pointed out some wood, he took the wood and he threw it in the waters and the waters were made pure, clean, and drinkable. They were decontaminated and the thirst of the people was slaked, quenched, and assuaged. Imagine that. What we discover is that God will meet the needs of the people. But don't think that God won't test us to see what we're made of. He will meet the needs. He does come through. He will provide. But you have to know where to turn. And turning to other human beings to complain is not the answer that works. Coming to God with a real need, Lord, 
we need water as if God doesn't know that. It's not that God needs to hear our prayer, but sometimes he needs for us to speak our need, to acknowledge what our need is. Our need is, Lord, water. It's not to complain. God, why have you brought us out here to kill us? Where's the water? What are we going to drink? If we instead were to take it to the next level and just say, Lord, you already know what the need is. We need something to drink. Our flocks are thirsty. Our children are thirsty. Will you not provide now for your children? And so Moses had the good, good sense to do that. He knew where to turn and what to do. Now, how many of you think the strategy that God brought that day was all about the wood? Do you think it was about finding some extraordinary unknown piece of wood that had the chemical composition that could change the water and make it safe to drink? Do you think if you could find the same kind of wood that it would do the same thing? Hmm. Maybe, but maybe not. Because this is really the deeper lesson. And if there's one takeaway today, this is what I want you to go home with. Ask yourself about the real difference between life and death. If you think about life and death, water is absolutely critical. I'm told that a human body can endure something like 40 days or more without food, but how many days can you go without water? Not very long, three plus a little bit more. I've seen people in hospice go a long time without water, but not too long. Without food, yes, but without fo water, not long. Our, even our bodies are about 70 or 72% water, if I'm not mistaken, so we need water to live. You might even go so far as to say water is life. Death and life, water makes all the difference. But here's what I want you to take away. That's not true. The difference between life and death isn't water. The difference between life and death is the Lord God. Can I say that again? The difference between life and death is not water. The difference between life and death is the Lord God. And that's what Moses knows. The people express their need. Moses, where will we get water? Well, Moses knows where to turn. It's not so much they're looking for a spring. What they're looking for is the God who knows where the springs are. He knows how to cleanse the water, even if they don't. It's not about the method, it's not about the wood, it's not about technique, it's not about strategy, it's all about the Lord their God. If you want to memorize the scripture, you might want to memorize Exodus 15, 26. Because this is where the Lord defines himself uh, uh, in relationship to his people. What does he say? I am the Lord, your healer. Just say that with me. I am the Lord, your healer. That's who God is. He can heal the bitter waters. He can be, heal the most bitter experience. He can heal embittered hearts. The goal of God is just to test his people, not to embitter them, not to make them bitter, but to make them better. Not so much to prove them as to improve their attitude. He wants them to trust him. And so he has to do all these things. He does the mighty and the miraculous at the Red Sea. And then he does the mundane and the ordinary to show that he is a God of blessing, a God who can provide for them day after day, not only in the worst and most difficult circumstances, but day after day, every day, the ordinary, the pedestrian, the normal, God can handle that as well as the extraordinary moments of our lives. So if there's one thing I could offer you today, the very simple takeaway would be this, that the difference between life and death isn't having water, isn't having our thirst slaked. The difference between life and death is knowing who this God is. He's the one who makes all the difference. I am the Lord, your healer. Hold tight to that profession of faith and I can assure you that all will be well. Thanks be to God for this extraordinary gift. Lord, let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have met us at the point of our need. Thank you, because some of us came here this morning with needs too deep for words, words that we can hardly articulate. You were here in advance. 
You knew who needed to be here today, Lord, who needed to hear a reassuring, comforting word. You know, some of us need to be challenged, some of us to be coached and reassured, others need to be confronted with the truth of our lives. We need to hear and to know what comes out of us when the pressure's on. And it's not always pleasing or pleasant, it's not always good or confident. Sometimes we murmur and grumble. Sometimes we complain and we take it to the top and we blame you for what's not right. That's not up to our standard, as if we are small gods. Lord, thank you for exposing us to the truth, for showing us where are the bitter and sore spots in our lives. You do it not to hurt or to harm, not to hinder us, but so that we might be exposed to the light of day, because you were the one who would tenderize our hearts. You were the one who would show us and ravish us again with your love. Thank you for showing us, as you did the children of Israel, that you are willing to be the God who provides for us. You are the God who means to lead us to a land of promise, but you will not allow us to remain the way that we were when we arrived here. You don't want us to be embittered against you or the circumstances of, of our lives, but to bring to you the circumstances of our lives because you are God over our circumstances. Thank you that you are the life giver. You are the one who makes the difference between life and death. Thank you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Tyler was very gracious and he said that you all would be celebrating communion today, coming together to the Lord's Supper. So it's an honor to do this. I've not had the privilege of doing this now for some time. So I'm grateful for all of you, the chance to, to eat and to drink together in the presence of the Lord. How I do it might be a little bit different than you're accustomed to, so I hope you will forgive that if I do it a, a little bit differently. I hope you won't uh, hold it against me that I would stand. I've read the scriptures that said they sat at table and I understand that Tyler does that, but I always like to stand in the presence of the Lord because it's an honor to be here with God's people. So as we come to the Lord's table, we remember that Luke the evangelist wrote of our risen Lord, that when he gathered a table with his disciples, their eyes were opened and they recognized him in the breaking of bread. And so we come to this table once again with all people in time and beyond time to have our eyes opened and to recognize him in the breaking of bread. So as we celebrate, I would say this, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God as we pray. Gracious God, we give thanks that you have led your people from the beginning of creation even until this moment. We give thanks that you are the one who brought Noah through the waters of the flood. You were the one who gave him a second start and a fresh chance, a new opportunity. You were the one who called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel to be your sons and daughters. You were the one who led them through Moses and Miriam and Aaron to a land of promise. You were the one who provided for them in the midst of the wilderness, who provided manna and meat and food and drink. You were the one who brought them to a land that flourished with milk and honey. You were the one who brought them through and assuaged their thirst. You were the one who satisfied their hunger and gave good things to them to eat. You were the one who in the fullness of time sent Jesus to be born of a human mother. You were the one who sent him to be baptized at the hands of John. You were the one who raised him out of the waters of baptism to be immersed in the presence of your Holy Spirit. You were the one who identifies us as your sons and daughters when we yield our hearts to you. We give thanks, Lord, that you have sent upon us the gift of your Holy Spirit to assure us day by day and to help us to grow into the kind of people that you would have us to be. And so we come to this table once again rejoicing that you have met our needs and called us to celebrate with you. We give thanks that you have enjoyed victory over sin, that you rose from the grave to show us what life looks like. 
and we remember that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus himself, our Savior, took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember in a similar manner after supper that Jesus took the cup of the, of the new covenant and said, this is my blood shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come not because you must, but because you may. Come, for all things are now ready. Well, as I understand it, I would invite you all to come down the center aisle to take a piece of bread and to take a cup and to return to your seats, your pews, by the outside aisles. We have gluten-free in the middle. I hold that for you. the bread of life, take and eat. The cup of blessing, take and drink.
Let us give thanks. Gracious God, we thank you for refreshing us at your table. May times of refreshing come on your people. Thank you for providing what we need. Thank you for being more gracious than we can possibly conceive or imagine. We pray blessings, Lord, as we get ready to go, as we get ready to depart. We pray that you would lift up your people. Thank you for holding us in your heart of hearts. Thank you for the strength to do all that you have commanded. Thank you for the things that you have prepared, purposed, and anointed for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. don't know it, it's page 426 in the hymnal. If we could stand as we get ready to sing together. Don't forget there are goodies out in the vestry.